taking advantage of what the markets give us. Uh, conditions obviously are always going to change, but there's always going to be opportunities. So when you walk away from this today, hopefully you have a new appreciation for markets aren't good, markets aren't bad. There's always opportunity, and uh, it's our job to extract profit and make money out of whatever market conditions are and whatever's happening. So there's always that opportunity there. Let me just do this if I could. Let me put my questions uh, box over here. And there we go. So yes, everybody's getting uh, getting sound. Everybody's seeing my screen. Let me just double check my audio so I can make sure that I'm seeing the bars. There you go. Can't be too careful these days. All right, good deal. So let's get started here today. Like I said, um, I'm excited to be able to talk about the, where the market is and what the market's doing. Uh, because of this great opportunity, a couple of things I'm going to talk about today is is how to use probability um, properly, or well, the way that I use probability, so that you can measure each and every trade uh, and make sure that it meets your criteria. And and really, we're also going to talk about a couple other things. I'm going to have a couple little secrets here for you. How I use options instead of stocks, so I can limit my risk and increase my returns. And, uh, and, and a way to attack the market, just because we have so, a lot of stocks that have had some sell-offs, just because they're low doesn't mean they can't go a lot lower. But I've got some great strategies to pick that gentle bottom and be there with a high probability trade when things do turn around. So um, we're going we're gonna to talk about a couple of those things. And, and really, I think the message to me, uh, you know, my message today is how to do this in a more relaxed uh, state of mind, I guess, uh, to have uh, a little bit less anxiety, have a plan, have some probability, and let the markets do the work. You know, you evaluate each and every trade as far as your your risk, your cost, your break even, and your probability, and just look at things in black and white. And uh, listening to that previous presenter, I was very impressed about how he just looks very simply at the chart patterns. Doesn't try and make it extremely complicated. The markets aren't that hard. Um, Making money is hard because there's emotion involved in what's going on, but you can evaluate the markets uh, very straightforwardly. All right, let me get into this a little bit further um, and and move on here. Let's just make sure that this is moving. And what I want to talk about today is today is the best in history is right now uh, in the markets for a number of reasons. But a month or two, month in the last six weeks, and we've seen all this market movement. That opportunity, recognize that. Like I said, markets aren't good or bad, they just are. So let's talk about why this is the best time ever for investors, and I mean in history. Like uh, we alluded to there, I started as a runner at the Chicago Board of Trade. Everybody has to start in the pits. Everybody starts regardless of whether you're straight out of high school or have an Ivy League, Ivy League education. That's how it used to be done. You had to learn by you know by doing, by being in the pits. You'd move up to a phone clerk and then trade for your, you'd be a, a, a debt clerk and then you'd trade for yourself and had to learn by doing. Now, things have changed dramatically and with electronic markets, you don't have to go through that process. Everybody now has an even playing field. Everybody has access to the opportunity that only the guys in the pits used to have. That's why they were financially very, very successful. They had a major advantage. Now at any time, you can click on a screen, trade any market, any direction, anywhere, anytime, short term, long term. And what's really important is you have access to the opportunities, whereas in the pit, if you traded treasuries, for example, or I dabbled in that, if there wasn't markets move, if the markets weren't moving, you know, where was the opportunity? You could try and force a trade, but you know what happens typically that when you force a trade. So, um, you know, I couldn't just step into another pit and trade crude oil or trade soybeans. Those guys had their territory. So oftentimes I would, you know, uh, leave in the afternoons and uh, here in Chicago, go up and uh, live near Wrigley Field and watch a Cubs game. And people would ask, you know, I'd get a phone call from my uh, girlfriend that became my wife, why I wasn't working. And the point was that that you can't make things happen. You know, now you have the opportunity to look on a screen and trade anywhere the action is, anywhere the opportunity is, any market, futures, forex, commodities, options, you know, whatever's moving, there's opportunity. Any market, any time, commissions essentially now are zero. Yes, they actually, you know, are a little bit, but I think that performs a function because without commissions, you wouldn't be as disciplined a trader and you'd be in and out more often. And also what's very important is how tight these bid-ask spreads are. The markets used to trade, stocks used to trade in, in, um, in, in eighths, uh, in quarters. You know, I mean, it's, it's amazing now that the spreads and even options nowadays are a penny for a lot of options. What that means is you can have the best risk control plan executed. You can decide where you want to get in, you can decide where you want to get out, and because there's oftentimes a lot of buyers, 
that when you want to be a seller and a lot of sellers when you want to be a buyer, you can execute your trading plan very efficiently. That's much different than it used to be many years ago. So as I've stated, I want you to view this with a different prism, that there's always opportunity. Be optimistic of the opportunity. If you've got the skills and the talent and the discipline, you can make money any time. Markets aren't good or bad. So I know people get frustrated, oh, well, the market's selling off. So I, I don't care whether the market goes up, down, or sideways. If you have the right tools in your toolbox, you can accomplish a lot of things. Let's talk about you know, what the markets are doing. When we talk about the market, you view the S&P as the market. It's a broad market indicator. You know, we've been in a five-year, six-year uptrend, and we finally had a little bit of a sell-off. The trend's been up, then it traded sideways for six months. The S&P traded between 2120 and 2040, and finally you saw some disappointment and a breakdown. Nothing happened fundamentally. It was just a breakdown, uh, and I can't remember the exact word for the, the fear of heights. Uh, is it acrophobia? Yeah, maybe. The fear of heights. The markets just didn't have any catalyst to continue to push it higher, but we've got... As far as fundamentally goes, nothing's changed. We still have low energy prices. We still have low interest rates. We still have no inflation. So, you know, nothing has changed. Corporate earnings will start again here, and they just started here this week. So that may provide the market a little bit of a catalyst. But you can see that the markets have bounced back, and now we're within a trading range in the last couple of months. But it did get back up into that 2,000 level in the S&P, so a pretty healthy recovery before this latest sell-off. But what I want you to pay attention to is all the way on the left-hand side, you can see where we had an October sell-off last year in 2014, and everybody thought that was the top of the market, and it bounced back and rallied and made new highs. Now, every single time the market sold off, it's bounced back and rallied and made new highs until it doesn't. Now, I'm not saying that this is this is the time, but I think there's going to be opportunities, and we'll look to see. Uh, you know, another thing to 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 add into this is that every every time it sold off, the distance of that sell-off on top of the old highs became the next measured move target. So. I'm not ready to say the top is in yet. Uh, people have been saying that for six years. There's been a lot of casualties in the marketplace. Uh, but like I said, it's about discipline. It's not about opinion. It's about having a plan and understanding the probability in each and every trade. And if you're wrong, you're wrong. But looking at the markets, let's talk about the VIX because that's the subject of today is how volatility is opportunity. And I'm not going to be talking about trading the VIX. I'm talking about using the VIX as simply an indicator, simply an indicator to help you determine what option strategy might be appropriate for those market conditions. And I've got some great strategies for the market conditions we're in now that are working fantastically. The VIX had a big bust out, busted out to 53, multi-year highs there, been trading at about 10, 11, 12, and it's kind of in a sideways range. The trend has been down for five years. We've been seeing the stock market move up and the VIX go down. Now, that's not to say that it can't go lower. The low in the VIX back in 2006 was below 10. So there's still more downside, even though it was at 10, you know, it can still always go lower. You know, high and low are just relative. Prices are relative. They always get a lot higher. They can always get a lot lower. I guess I can go to zero, but, it, you know, you know what I'm saying here. So anyways, the VIX now has declined back underneath the 20 level. 20 was the high in June, July, and August, and that was the breakout. Once it broke out, boom, off to the races, up to 53. Now it's back below 20. And actually, I was just doing the calculation. The VIX is down 65% off of that August 24th high. Now, again, high and low are relative. If you would have said the VIX is at 20, you know, six months ago or eight months ago, that would have been a high level. But now it seems kind of low compared to where it was on that extreme spike. But I equate what's been happening in the VIX over the last five years to kind of whack-a-mole, the game the kids play at the mall. Every time the VIX pops up, they whack it back down. And so we'll look to see if that can continues, but that looks like what's happening once again in the VIX. But you can see the trend is down sideways and then up uh, in the VIX. The overall trend is very much down. A little quick about me before we get into some of these strategies. I've been doing this for 25 years. Hopefully uh, I'm an old grizzled trader, but I don't look like an old grizzled trader. Um, I've been at the Board of Trade, uh, Traded Options uh, here uh, on equities and on futures, like I said, since 1990. I've uh, been involved in the marketplace, so I've seen a lot of market conditions. It's very important that not one size fits all. You've got to take your strategies and have a basket of them so that you can apply the right strategy at the right time. You know, it might be a good situation for butterflies. It might be a good situation for selling credit spreads. It might be a good situation for straight outright buying options. It's, it's not the tool. It's not the strategy or the attack. Uh, I'm sorry, it's not the, you know, it's the, it's 
the strategy that you choose for the market conditions that, that make the difference. So I've been doing this for, for many, many years. I don't have all the answers, but I've become more comfortable in trusting probability. Uh, instincts are good, opinions are fine, but probability really allows you to objectively evaluate each and every trade equally. So you can determine does it fit your profile or not and you want to move forward. So let's talk about how to use market fear, which is volatility. Market fear is just another word for volatility. Volatility is good. Volatility means opportunity. Market, volatility means the markets are moving. If the markets are moving, we can take a high probability piece out of that overall movement. And now is the time. Uh, actually, just a couple weeks ago when the markets were extremely volatile, there seemed to be even more opportunities there. So if you talk, if you stay until the end of the presentation here at the end, I'll give you a little trick uh, because what we've been seeing here was that increase in volatility, uh, people have managed, and it's unfortunate, that even when they were correct in picking the bottom of the market, you know, when the market had sold off and it was down near the lows, people have put on positions that are losing money because they didn't understand how to minimize that impact of volatility on their position. Even though they were 100% right on the market direction, those, uh, those positions are not profitable. I'll show you a little trick to, uh, to make sure that you maximize that when, when you're correct on the market direction. So let's talk about the most important factor when it comes to the markets. It's uh, understanding your greatest asset, which is time. Enough time to be right. I can't stress that enough. Let's put on positions that you have enough time to be right. So we're going to focus on using time and probability so we can make good, smart decisions and have enough time to be right. Because it's nothing more, you know, nothing's more frustrating than being right but not having enough time or the wherewithal or the staying power to be there. So let's use a very simple methodology. Like I talked about, simple is best. Very simple, straightforward methodology. I want to evaluate each and every trade, and each and every trade is its own event. Its own event. We're looking at having high probability, high success rates in a string of trades over a period of time. So I want to focus on cost, risk, then the risk reward, the probability, and the break even. I can use those five factors of to, equal, to, to decide each and every trade, is it worth our time, effort, and money to, to go after it. So to do so, what I want to talk about today are options. Now options are very straightforward, can be very straightforward and very simple. A lot of people make them more complicated than they need to be. You know, it's, it's very straightforward. An option is an option and the strength of options are you have oftentimes you can construct limited risk strategies. So what I want to talk about very quickly is some of the myths, some of the things that smart people have wrong about options. Options are a great tool and as my lifestyle has changed, I have focused more on using options as my vehicle of choice. I can have some staying power, I don't have to watch the markets minute by minute, I'm using them as a limited risk vehicle, less cost, better returns, there are many benefits of options. They're not complicated, that's the myth number one that you're just using the right option strategy based on what you think the market's going to do. Either the market's going to go up, it's going to go down, or it's going to go nowhere. And you can construct option strategy to take advantage of those directions or non-direction. Uh, and, and most times, almost all the time, I want to put on a position that has absolutely positive limited risk. Now, the problem where people you know, get, get themselves in trouble with options, we'll talk about that in a second, but Myth number two is they think options are for gamblers. Um, people says here, someone makes a comment that there are a lot of moving parts in options trading. I want to make it very simple. I'm not going to get into the, I'm not going to get into the Greeks. I'm not going to get into, you're using option as a ve the option as a vehicle. Oftentimes I just use a basic stock substitution strategy. But selecting the right option with the right amount of time that's going to give you the best payoff, uh, that's, that's very key. So, you want to understand, you want to look at high probability plays to put odds in your favor. Oftentimes people buy cheap out of the money options because they're cheap. And the reason they're cheap is because they got a low probability of success. The guys here at the exchange sell what we call lottery tickets. Those are the cheap out of the money options that unless there's a dramatic move in a very short period of time, those options are ex expire worthless. And that's why they cost, you know, $150 or $200 or, or, or something inexpensive that the odds of you being successful are very, very small. If you come to the exchange, you'll see some of the best sports cars and luxury cars in the world because these guys sell short-term options. So even if the stock has a 
5% move in a month or a 10% move in a month, that's really significant. A lot of those options will just die on the vine. Options, if you're an options buyer, you want to buy as much time as you can. If you're an options seller like those guys, you want to count on that time decay. I'm going to show you a couple of strategies that utilize both of those because time is the key component. You want to put odds in your favor. This is not gambling. This is not Texas Hold'em where you're putting it all in on one position. This is all about probability. The key here is time, like I just alluded to. Use time in your favor. If you're an options buyer, buy more time than you need. Okay, even if you think X is going to happen or this stock's going to do this in X period of time, why not buy enough time to be right? I always err on having more time as opposed to less. If you don't use it, so what? So what? If you need to use it, you have it. Nothing is more frustrating than not having enough time and being right with the trade. So to give you an example of that, I often get accused uh, by my trading friends and associates here in this business, here in Chicago, of buying too much time, of using options as a, as a long-term position. And here's an example, something like XLF. Uh, an XLF option here, XLF is the ETF, the exchange traded fund that tracks the financial sector. So instead of buying uh, um, JP Morgan Chase or Citibank, you know, you can buy a basket that controls all the stocks. You don't have the individual stock risk. And what's interesting about the uh, XLF, XLF recently just got to the halfway point of its recovery from the 2009 highs. To, I'm sorry, the, the 2000, uh, from that decline from the financial crisis. Finally recovered half of its losses. All the other stock indexes or major markets have recovered all of their losses and more. But the banks still lagging behind. They still have a lot more upside, in my opinion, in the banks. You'll see when the next quarter comes out how much money they generate, how much money they make, you know, profit, profit on a quarterly basis. You're going to hear five billion, three billion, you know, two and a half billion, so forth and so forth. So XLF was a good opportunity. If you look here on a chart, October of last year. So about this time last year, XLF was, you know, down there near the lows. Not even picking the lows, but I'm going to show you the strategy because I had some confidence that that stock was, that ETF was going to make a move to the upside. I didn't have the exact time frame right, but I bought enough time to be right. So back then in October, the, the July options, uh, I'm sorry, they were January options, January 2016, still have time left. I'm already out of the position, but, but in that example, uh, a year and I think four months of time, if I was not mistaken. So about an in-the-money call, and we're going to talk about that as a strategy, as a stock substitution strategy, an in-the-money call for January 2016. Buying a 19 call when the low is 1948, buying an in-the-money call, so it's like being long the stock from below the lows with limited risk, costs about $425. $425, now the break-even on that was you take that $19 strike, add your cost to that option, works out to be 23 and a quarter. So 23 and a quarter was the break-even, which was not that not that far away from where the market was trading. It was about uh, 50 cents away from where the market was trading. So what I was saying that I needed that ETF to move 50 cents in more than a year. I can't read those purple numbers, but I can't. It's 400 and some days, so it was like a year, a year and four months, if I can remember. Now that's not a that's not a. I'm not being Nostradamus by trying to predict that that stock that ETF could move up 50 cents in a year and four months. I'm putting myself in position for success. That's the idea there. So the exit point was back in July. We finally had a move to the upside in XLF. That option gained 50%. What was my maximum risk? $425. I put in a stop loss at half of what I pay, so really $200. A 50% return. Yes, it did take some time. It took longer than I, than, than I thought, but I had that luxury of time. So that's using and buying more time than you need. And getting out in July, it still had six months of time if I needed it to continue to move higher. So that's important is to focus on the right amount of time. And the right amount of time is enough to be right. Also another myth is that people think options are risky, which is wrong. Options are no more risky than stock or Forex or commodities or anything else. It's not the vehicle, it's the lack of discipline uh, and the number one focus for a, a trader is risk. Before you get into a trade, what are you risking is the number one question you have to ask yourself. 
what dollar amount, what percentage amount, what effect does it have on your account, and so forth. You want to minimize that risk so no one trade has any inordinate impact on your, on your trading or your portfolio mentally or dollar-wise. Control your risk. That's the difference between that's the difference between a novice trader and a professional trader. A professional trader will focus on the risk. A novice trader will focus on what they can make. I want to make five hundred dollars. I want to make a thousand dollars. A professional says, "Listen, I'm risking five hundred dollars. I'm risking two hundred fifty dollars. If I'm wrong, I'm wrong, and that's it. Move on to another trade." It's a series of high probability events is what you're trying to uh, capitalize on. And lastly, a lot of people think option management takes too much time. No, not the way I do it. I'm using options as a vehicle, and I'm using them to fit my lifestyle. I'm looking at options as more as having more staying power and the ability to ride through some ups and downs, so I can look at things more on a weekly basis. I used to be very involved in the markets as trading uh, actively, intraday moves, you know, period of minutes, <laughs> hours, and and so forth. You know, that at the time seemed like a great way to participate in the markets. Now that I've stepped back a bit, I've got a young daughter, I like to take her to dance, take her to school, pick her up from school, you know, that I don't want to focus on the markets minute by minute, but I still want to take, take advantage of the opportunities. Wouldn't you want to be able to step back and trade things more long term, more arm's length distance, so you don't have to make decisions and worry about every tick up or down? You know, so that, that has a lot of advantages, and options are vehicle that, that allow you to, to do that. So I think that gives you some freedom. I think that gives you some staying power. I think that gives you less anxiety. Uh, and I find, found that it fits most people's lifestyle. Most people have jobs. Most people can't sit there and watch the markets all day. Those that can you know, need an extreme amount of discipline, an extreme amount of discipline. This backs up that discipline. You still have a trading plan. I have an entry price. I have an exit price. If it goes for me, you saw that 50%. I have an exit price if it goes against me. I have a plan uh, for that, but you know, I'm not, I'm not going to be, uh, the market's not going to force me to make uh, decisions uh, in, in, in short order. And you know how the markets work. When it forces you to make a decision, typically human nature is to make the wrong one. That's just how it works. When you, you know, unfortunately, when you should be getting uh, in, you're getting out. Unfortunately, when you should be getting out, you're getting in. Um, and that's just kind of the human nature and the psychology of how the markets work. And uh, that's something that you have to have a, a better plan to fight through. Because the more that we think about what we think the market's going to do, uh, we're, we're you know impacted. We're having getting our emotion involved with in what's happening. All right, let's talk a couple on a couple strategies today. We're going to talk about uh, strategies that have, when the market conditions have high relative volatility. And so, yes, we're high. We're not as high as we were just two weeks ago, but we're still still uh, at, a, at a pretty lofty level um, compared to where we were you know, six months or so ago. Someone uh, makes a nice comment. I appreciate that. 463 days, so your eyes can see better than I can. So that's 365 plus 100 days. So that's one year and three months with, for that XLF. Uh, someone also makes a commentary about my about my Cubs. It's very interesting. Cubs tomorrow night. I had an apartment across the street from Wrigley Field. One of those apartments that you could look and see into the ball game. It was it was epic. Uh, unfortunately, the Cubs are the Cubs. I'm uh, debating depending on what happens uh, tomorrow. Uh, whether they're driving to St. Louis to watch the game because it'll be easier to get tickets and a more enjoyable experience to go to St. Louis, I think, than to uh, battle people for tickets uh, here at Wrigley. But anyways, all right, let's talk about high relative volatility. That's what I want to get into. All right, a couple of strategies. I'm going to talk about the Iron Condor, and I'm going to talk about cash-secured put sales. Iron Condor is simply selling credit spreads. You're making money not from where the market goes, but from where it doesn't go. So let's get into the iron condor first, if we could. An iron condor, you need the market to stay within a range uh, at expiration. You're going to take advantage of time decay by selling uh, credit spreads above the market and below the market, thinking that the market's not going to go up or the market's not going to go down above these certain points within a certain period of time. And the way that you can capitalize on that is typically with about 25 or 30 days before expiration because that's when the option that you've sold in a covered way, and I'll show you that in a second, um, will lose its time value. As you come into those last 30 days prior to expiration, that's when the option 
uh, that's when the premium melts out of it, like an ice cube in your hand. It will melt. So let's look at a couple of examples here. Now, there's a couple of rules for the iron condor, and I'll talk about those in a second, but let me see what stocks are trading and looking to possibly continue to trade in a sideways range where we can collect some premium on that. Let me just check my audience view one more time. Looking good. All right, so you can look at something like an Amazon. Amazon's kind of trading in a range, but there are some rules that we want to look for, and I'll show you those in a second. There's some rules that we want to use for uh, this. Uh, I, I'm getting a comment here that says, I would say most of us say that when we started with buying options, they were out of the money and not giving enough time. I know this, um, this is how I lost money, and until I figured that out, buying the in-the-money plays in at least 30 days or so till expiration. Very good, Paul. That's that's the lesson to be learned. I'll get into the specifics of that to even height your, heighten your probability more in very specific rules, but that's what we use for stock substitution. Let me just go through very quickly the idea behind the iron condor. The market can only go one way. It can only go up or it can go only go down. So you're, if you're selling a credit spread up above or selling a credit spread down below, um, you're going to make money on one side or the other. So if we want to just construct one of these for Amazon right now, this may not necessarily be the ideal time. We're at 540 in Amazon. This may not be the ideal time because the October options expire in a handful of days and the November options have a little bit too much time. They've got 48 days. So let me do this. Let me go into an order that we did that I looked at here for Amazon because this was the iron condor where we're looking to see. Okay, so the idea is here. Um, it's trading about 260. The idea here was to sell it for about 250. The October position, this was a couple weeks ago, uh, at that time frame that we want, typically about 30 days left till expiration. Um, you can see this was the 24th of September, so that was right in that time window with this. The idea here was to sell a 550 call and buy a 555 call. All right, so let's just look at this. So the thinking is that this, this market's going to stay within a range and sell a 550 call, let me go back to the chart, and buy a 550, 555 call. Here we go. And the thinking is that it's going to stay below 550, all right? But if it doesn't, we've got a 555 call up above. And it's also going to stay above 520, and we could just draw a line here, 520 at expiration, and we'll have a 515 put as downside protection. The idea behind this is you're selling credit spreads on both sides, so you're guaranteed to make money on one or the other. You want to make sure you have a good risk-reward ratio, and you can see the volatility here in Amazon is about 50%, so it's a nice healthy amount to get some premium and the ideal situation is that it finishes right in the middle at expiration. If you can look at that graph, you can see that that's what you're looking for. Uh, right in that middle at, at expiration. Let's preview that trade here. Okay. All right. So let me just construct that right here. And how, how to go about that? I want to go to the October. All right, so I'll just I'll just show you the upper side. And so the idea here is we were selling the 550 call, and these iron condors are something that you can do on a monthly basis, making sure that you're getting the probability and the risk reward that you're looking for. So you want to uh, create a spread here. I'm going to sell the 550. Because I think that the stock in, in this particular instance, that the, the thinking is that the stock's going to be below 550 at expiration. And if I'm wrong, I want to buy the 555 call. All right, so my maximum risk is that $5 in between minus what I take in. Okay, so no matter what happens, the most I can lose is the five, $5. Now, in this instance, taking in, you know, $1.50 or so. Um, so five dollars minus a dollar fifty is 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 three fifty, and then you'd want to do the same thing on the downside. So you sell a five 
20 put and then buy a 515. And add a put and then buy a 515. Okay. So then you're taking in about 250 and your maximum risk is $5. So you make money anywhere in between these, these break even. So let me create this order and put it in at 250 so you can see what it looks like. So if it stays in the middle there, you get to collect that premium of that 250. You're risking 250 to make 250, and then you'd want to look and make sure that your probability is, you know, above 65% uh, to get that done. So this is an example of an iron condor making money from where the market, where the stock doesn't go. So the break-even on this, if Amazon finishes anywhere between 517 and 552, there's money to be made. There's money to be made. So that's that's the lesson to be learned with the iron condor. Now I want to get into um, the rules behind it, but first off, let's go here. It's two credit spreads. The market can only go one direction or another. This is utilized when the volatility is higher and you're getting more premium by selling wings outside the market. I'm looking for a one-to-one -one risk reward and I want to try to find a probability of 70%. You want to put this on typically with 30 days left till expiration. I don't make any adjustments. You know your worst case scenario is you can lose 250. The best case scenario is you can make 250. You put it on as a spread, you take it off as a spread. The other strategy I want to talk about very quickly and get into this is the option wheel strategy. I think this is more apropos for the conditions we're at now. The idea here is to sell cash secured puts looking to get 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10% return in less than a month. Okay? Naked puts. Naked, but they're cash secured. I can't stress this enough. You're looking to get small monthly returns that add up over time. This you can do in addition to your monthly trades, uh, in addition to your directional trades because the options expire every month. Use the rule of 72. If you can get a 4% return, that may not seem like a whole lot, but annualize that, 4% in 30 days, and you take whatever return you get annualized and you divide that, divide 72 by that return. If you can get 8%, um, take 72 divided by 8%, that means that you're going to get a nine, it's going to take you nine years to double your account. This is also an investment manager trick to build a for portfolio, a way to get into a stock at a lower level or buy the stock at a discount. So you can buy it at a discount or get paid not to. So it's a win-win situation. You only do this in stocks that you want to own. I'll talk about the option wheel as a way to build a portfolio as well, but I can't stress enough. Only stocks like you want to own. You're not going to do a covered call on a stock that you don't want to own for the long term because if you buy a $50 stock and you take in a dollar when you sell a covered call and the stock goes down $30, that $1 you took in isn't going to be of any help. So only stocks that you want to own that you could be prepared to own for months, maybe even years. Oftentimes, they're going to be high relative volatility stocks with typically lower prices. I'm typically looking for single-digit stocks or stocks not more than $15 because what's the downside on a single-digit stock? It's like a lifetime option. can only go to zero. So selling a cash-secured put strategy is no riskier than a covered call. It has the same risk profile as a covered call. So here's an example. Sprint. Cheap stock, $5.61. I'm not going to use the word cheap. An inexpensive stock. Had solid support down there at the $5 level. Um, had sold off. The volatility had spiked. You could sell a $5.50 put for $0.20. Cents. Now, that's not a huge amount of credit, but that is a 4% return in three weeks when the stock was trading at $5.60. Worst case scenario, you're going to be long that stock from $5.30. You take it, your strike price minus the 20 cents you'd put in, that would be the price you would get long. And you've got, for each option, it's 100 shares, so your maximum risk is your $530. Now, looking at it mathematically, that 530, if the market's trading at 560, the break-even on that is 6% lower. So what's the worst-case scenario that you're, you know, that, it, that you're long from 530, which is down there at your lows? You're also seeing bullish divergence in the, in the chart, meaning that it made new lows but not new highs of volatility. So a number of things were adding up. Uh, in the fact was the worst case scenario you're going to be long that stock from five dollars and thirty cents. Best case scenario you're going to get that four percent return in three weeks. So there's Sprint. Boom! It takes off. Stocks stock moved up to six seventy five. Look at that. There you go. Breaks out to the upside. Now the downside here is that we only made four percent. All right, but it's something you can do on a consistent basis on a portfolio of stocks, three, four, five stocks every month to generate a little bit of 
a little bit of revenue with a high degree of probability each and every month uh, counting on time decay, counting on that somebody else buying that, that out of the money option or in this example, you know, the probability against them and counting on the time decay. So the stock moved 20%, a huge move. Now in its position, it was 4%, but 4% annualized is a big, big, big uh, return. It expired worthless for a 4% return in just three weeks. The idea here is build a portfolio on stocks you want to own or use this as a way to get into stocks uh, at a lower price or get paid not to. Now last October I talked about how the market had come unglued and volatility spiked. It was a perfect scenario for this cash secure put sale strategy. Uh, JCPenney, ANR, Radio Shack, uh, Plug, CLF, all of these had great returns in a very short period of time, counting on that time decay, 4%, 12%, 6%, 4%, 7%. They all had more than 70% probability. Again, the rules are only stocks you want to own, stocks that you could be in for the long term, months, maybe years. Typically, these are going to be high volatility stocks, and there's a number of them right now. I can show you some examples that we went through in the last couple of weeks. All right, let me see here. U.S. Steel. The date on the U.S. Steel trade selling the uh, October uh, $13 put for $0.60, cents, so 5% return on risk, uh, or buying the stock 15% lower. It's a way to get into stocks instead of trying to pick the bottom that you can sell a cash secured put as a way to get in at a discount. If you get a put to you, guess what? The option wheel strategy, then you can sell the covered call against it um, to lower your cost basis again. That's the strategy behind it. Lower price stocks, higher, vol higher volatility, and it's a probability revenue play. The process here is to sell the put, get, put, get the stock, and then sell covered calls against it until you get taken out. So it's all about probability. Again, buying stocks at a discount or get paid not to generate high probability small monthly revenue streams. And then repeat. Repeat is the key here. Let me answer some questions here and then I'll show you that little, uh, that little uh, trick to take advantage of being correct in the direction but getting squished by the market. Um, someone says Amazon uh, has earnings coming up on the 21st and that's why it's an October position because those October options expire on the 16th. I wouldn't do a November position for that iron condor. Uh, any other stocks similar to Sprint? There's plenty of them right now. There are a lot of single digit stocks that have been gotten beat up. Now they, we've seen a little bit of a bounce. Uh, we just did this in the in SUNE, Sun Edison, just did this in um, uh, Freeport McMoran. Um, these stocks that have gotten crushed, 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 but the volatility is high. So there are great opportunities there for the October positions. I wouldn't be getting into new October positions now because there's only you know a handful of days left and you're not getting enough premium. The idea here is to make sure you're getting at least four or five percent return on risk in uh, in less than 30 days. And so I'll start looking at the November position as we get closer to uh, that 30 days. And it's, again, something that we can do on a monthly basis. Um, okay, so someone else had some questions here um, about this. And then I can show you uh, my, little, my little trick here. But hopefully I've opened your eyes to opportunities that no matter what the conditions are, um, there's going to be there's going to be a, a strategy, something that you can take out of your toolbox to take advantage of it. So here you go, S-U-N-E, Sun Edison. This is a stock that was a $30 stock, got crushed. The 650 put sold for 60 cents, 10% potential return on risk in less than three weeks. So you're using that volatility to your advantage. So if I look very quickly here, if I look at S-U-N-E now, that same 650 put, what would it cost to buy it back? You know, ideally, it's just going to expire worthless. So let's hope that that, that happens. But that 650 put now is going to cost about 13 cents. So the majority of the premiums have already been raked in. And if you look at something like SUNE, the volatility is at 100%. So you want to find stocks that have that extreme spike in volatility. And, you know, it even went lower uh, after we put on this position. But overall, what we're looking at is it being above an X point at expiration. And that X point was 15% below where the stock was trading. Looking at some quick examples here, I was trying to focus on ACI because you've got some extreme volatility, 200 and some percent, but um, the November options have too much time, so I don't want to mess with that. And we've already seen a pretty healthy dollar bounce off the lows. 
in ACI. It's a probability trade. That's all we're looking at is probability. Rig, Chesapeake, a lot of these beaten down commodities uh, and resources stocks I think are candidates to keep an eye on, but that's something I'll be looking at here for the next, next couple of weeks. Let me answer some questions and let me get back into, there we go, into this. The whole idea is using probability. Hopefully, that you're with me now, that we can control and choose probability. I want to choose trades that have a 70% probability. That's my window. That's my personality. So, you know, if you want to be more aggressive, you can be more aggressive, but you're not going to have as much success. So you want to be selective. So don't, don't you think that's important to be able to choose that probability, to be able to select that and have the tools and these, these option strategies allow you to do that. And uh, I, I think that that's crucial, that you're able to look at things objectively and find strategies that work for you. Rig looked like it had a breakout coming soon. Well, people have been saying that in commodities for the last year plus. Someone asked me if I do, if I like using weekly options. No, I don't venture into weeklies. I'm looking at the time decay for that last 21 to 30 days is where that really accelerates. Um, but weekly options are the same kind of thing. You have that opportunity instead of every, every month, every week to profit from more, not what the stock necessarily does, but what it doesn't do in using that probability. So that's what I thought was important. What yeah, I wanted to talk about. Heads up, you've got about five minutes remaining. Okay. That's, I was just going to start right here and give everybody a chance to be a, a trial member of my Bullseye Option 2.0 program, my subscription service where I have training events and I have uh, weekly webinars. You will also get a nightly video, my where's, my where's My Head At video where I talk about either a stock, an ETF, or an option play that's on my radar. Uh, I give uh, trade recommendations, one, uh, if not two a week that are specifically focused on probability, to put probability in your favor. And that's what I was showing you with the Sun Edison. That's what I was showing you with the U.S. Steel. Also, just last week, a straight outright uh, call option uh, on McDonald's. And I'll show you that uh, here in a second as well. But I want everybody to go to bullseyeoption.com slash T-R-Y and sign up. I'll put that in the box there and I'll answer some more questions. But that's a service I have. You get a $7 30-day trial membership. Uh, to my monthly service, a lot of content, a lot of information, and hopefully a different way, a more optimistic way to look at how to take what the markets give us and how to extract profits on a consistent, more probable basis here. Uh, someone says, I would like to er learn options and have a step-by-step -step guide how to uh, place my options, a beginner, uh, and finding all the instruction too quick. Well, I went through this very quickly, but if, if I go back to, if I go back to and show you the, the, trade, um, the trade alert, here's an example of a trade alert email that got sent out. Specifically, which option to sell at what price, let you know what the risk rating is, know you know what the probability is, uh, a way to generate 10% potential return in less than three weeks, and then I'll get into the strategy, why that sector, why that stock, why that strike, why that month, and so you have all the information on each and every one of these to learn the process so you can you know, recognize, uh, um, recognize candidates yourself, but you get a very in-depth um, uh, alert for each and every trade. So this is an example of a trade on SUNE. Let me just try and find one on McDonald's. Uh, I want everybody to sign up again at bullseyeoption.com slash try but I wanted to give you an example on McDonald's, um, and here we go. So here, this was a trade alert, and this was just Friday. This was Friday after the unemployment number came out. The markets were weak, but I think everybody digested the information and realized, hey, guess what? With a weak number, they're not going to raise rates. If they don't raise rates, guess what? The market's going to bounce back. The market's bounce back. Had a big reversal. So looking at McDonald's, McDonald's has been getting a lot of abuse, but actually was up 5% on the year, one of the leading Dow stocks. Uh, before this trade last Friday, and it's a January option, so it's got more time than I need, but I want to show you the process here of minimizing minimizing the impact of volatility on this, because volatility had increased in all options, obviously. The key here is to buy the in-the-money call, and in-the-money call bought the 90 call for January, gives you the right to be long from 90, the stock was trading at 98, so it was $8 in the money, it was trading for about 9.50. So at about $1.50 of time value. So what that meant was the stock needed to move up $1.50 between now and January, third Friday of January, to get above the break-even. So 
That's what we're looking for. Now, McDonald's just made new highs today. Actually, it's a January option, I guess. I'm sorry, it's a January option, so it had even more time. Uh, more time than I need. McDonald's made new highs today. I could have bought the October option, but because volatility is, in relative terms is lower than it was two years ago, lower than it was three years ago, lower than it was four years ago, that options buying in the money calls, those deep in the money calls, have, are, very little, are, are only a little bit impacted by volatility. Only that time value component, that $1.50 time value component is in, impacted by volatility. By buying something that's intrinsically has a lot of value, that part isn't in, impacted by volatility, so the break even is very, very reasonable. And so buy something that has a delta of 70 or 75% and it's going to give you the best payoff, the best payoff. All right, let me put this in the box here and get back to finish this up so you guys can all see my offer and sign up and I will hopefully have everybody in my next uh, weekly webinar, which is a chance for you to ask questions, talk about stocks, look at individual strategies, uh, bounce ideas off me. Um, so let's get here in the in the window box here, uh, sign, up, sign up at bullseyeoption.com slash TRY, $7 is what's going to cost you, uh, $97 is a normal monthly subscription, test drive it for 30 days, find out you know, what it's all about. Um, so here in the chat box, you can just sign in right here, and I'll take you to the link, it'll cost you 7 bucks, and hopefully my optimism rubs off. That's what I'm trying to do here, is get everybody in the right frame of mind, that markets aren't good, markets aren't bad, that there is opportunity. And right now, I think there's an extreme amount of opportunity. I mean, this, this, this is, is, is fantastic. The markets are moving. I'm not telling you that the markets are going to go up or down necessarily, but we can put on high probability, probability trades uh, on a rather consistent basis. Someone said you were going to show a way to pick the trend at the end. Don't forget, what I was showing you is how to pick the right option to limit the impact of volatility. So the rule for me is to buy an in-the-money call with a delta of about 70%. Now that 70% delta is, again, the only Greek that I brought up all afternoon, trying to make options very simple and to understand, that that 70% that delta means that it's going to act much like the stock. So it's a stock substitution strategy. Instead of buying shares at McDonald's, I bought the 90 call for January as a stock substitution. It cost me about $9.50. So, but of that, $8, it was $8 in the money. So all I needed, needed was the stock to move $1.50 in the next, by the time January expiration to be above a break even. And the stock's already moved to 102 today, made new highs. So it's an example of a couple things, buying the right option and buying more time than you need. I can always get out of it. I can sell it tomorrow. I can sell it next week. But guess what? I have until January for good things to happen. So using an option that has a high delta like that will minimize the impact of volatility, whereas buying an out-of-the-money option, even if you're right on direction, unless you're completely right with your timing, a lot of times you're going to get squeezed out on. So the idea is instead of buying low probability out-of-the-money out options, buy these in-the-money options that act like the stock. And for our purposes, mathematically, the delta, another little trick here is, the delta is the approximation that that option, option will be in the money at expiration. So think about it. Do you want an option that has a 10, 20% chance of being in the money at expiration? No. You want an option that's got a 70% chance. I try and find positions that have a 75% chance, 75% probability, and just look at that delta. That gives you the guidance that you need. So someone says, go Cubs and Blackhawks. Well, okay, we're not in the hockey season. I want to focus on the Cubs right now. It's been a long time coming, so let's, let's hope they can put themselves together. Let me see if there's any other questions, but again, bullseyeoption.com slash try, and that will take you to the order page um, right here, $7, bullseyeoption.com, uh, $7 trial offer. You get 30 days, available now, a lot of content, a lot of information, and a lot of my thoughts uh, to hopefully get you in that right frame of mind that there's money to be made. Um, lastly, I'd like to throw up a testimonial. Uh, and, and a kind of a life lesson as well. Um, this is a testimonial from a customer that made $53,000 um, in some GDX call options from a, a trade reclamation last year. 50, 53% return in less than a month. That's a fantastic return. Now, obviously that person's trading size. What I want to tell you is to start slowly. The markets are always going to be here. That's the life lesson. Learn to trade one option. 
You don't need to be a five option trader or a 10 option trader. You can grow and become that down the road. Start with one option. While you may not make a whole lot of money or lose a whole lot of money on the trade, you're going to learn the process and the discipline. Then you become a two lot trader, a five option trader, a 10 option trader. Actually, what's best to do is take your account size, your account and divide it into 20 equal pieces of pie. So each trade is an equal dollar amount. It's not the number of options that you trade that's important. It's that you're allocating an equal dollar amount to each and every trade. So I wanted to just let you know that you don't need to be the big trader. Start small. The markets are always going to be here. This is a lifetime endeavor. This is learning discipline. This is having the right tools in the toolbox. There's no one trick pony, but having the tools and the optimism to make money whatever the markets do. So I think that wraps up everything here today. Let me go one more time uh, to our offer page. There you go. Here we go. There you go. Uh, bullseyeoption.com slash T-R-Y and I want to thank everybody for their time everybody to enjoy the baseball game tonight and then tomorrow I have a couple more questions what do you do when the stock passes your short strike before expiration if you sell a put short nothing will happen to you the worst case scenario is you have the money in your account to buy the shares at a lower level like I showed you in Sun Edison selling 650 call for 60 cents you have to have the $590 to buy the 100 shares if you get it put to you it, the, it won't be put to you till expiration. Uh, if the stock's below that strike at expiration, then you'll be assigned the shares. But if it fluctuates and goes down there or goes up, goes down, goes down, you, you, the markets, you're not required to do anything uh, because someone's going to make more money by offsetting that position than they are by exercising it anyways. But it's a way to get into the stock at a lower level or get price or get paid not to. Think about it. You know, a portfolio manager wants to buy an Apple, but he wants to buy it at 100. He puts in a price, says, I'll buy 1,000 shares at 100, and waits and waits and waits and waits and waits, okay? And just lets it sit there. And if it goes down to 100, fine, he gets it. If it never does, he never gets it. Well, why not get paid on it? Sell the 105 put or the 102 and a half put for $2, and then that puts your break even at, at, at 100. So if you get, you know, in the meantime, you could sell the October position and get paid. And if it's not down to that level, you can do it in November and then you can do it in December. Keep selling these cash secured puts as a way to generate revenue. It's what portfolio managers do as a way to get into this stock. So again, I want to thank everybody for their time. Someone says it was well explained. I know I talk fast, but I wanted to make sure that we had our 45 minutes. Bulls eye option slash try. I want to look forward to everybody being in our next weekly webinar where you again Ask your questions. We can talk strategy. We can look at different ways. I'm not going to give you the uh, specifics on how to play an individual stock. That's not my role. I'll give you my specific alerts that, you know, that is my role. But if you mention a stock, I'll maybe show you two, three, four different ways to look at it. You make the decision. But for me, it's all about probability. Put yourself in position for success.